You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in London, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures, number 313 in the Collected Works by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Illness and Therapy, Spiritual Scientific Aspects of Healing. It is the second course given for doctors. Lecture 2, given in Dornach on the 12th of April, 1921. As I said yesterday, we will consider the human being in relation to his supersensible nature, on this occasion focusing on phenomena of pathology and therapy from this perspective. Yesterday we characterized the physical body by stating that physical activity is only really present in our head. If we wish to properly understand this physical body, we must naturally also rise one level higher to consider the etheric body in a fully specific way. Insight into the human being shows us that a distinct and separate action of the physical body exists only in the head. In the other bodies or aspects of the human organism, the physical body works in more undifferentiated interplay with the higher supersensible bodies. In the head, therefore, the supersensible levels as such can function in or through thinking, feeling, and will because they are first imprinted in the head. Thus have their etheric, astral, and also I imprint there. These are present as imprints, or, if you like, as pictures of the supersensible aspects. Only the physical body, as yet, makes no imprint or replica of itself, doing so only during the course of life. This is why we can say that the physical body acts in the head in a purely physical way, while in the other human limbs no purely physical action as such exists. Several people did not understand yesterday when I said that the I, capital, makes an imprint of itself. The I makes an imprint for itself. This is something we will properly understand only as long as we do not interpret it in the ordinary sense, in other words, too physically. What the I creates for itself as imprint while remaining free, as it alone does in the limb and metabolic system, is not something we can examine by comparing it, for instance, with a plaster cast. No, the imprint which the eye creates is a very fluid one. In fact, you'll get a better idea of it when you're moving than when you stand still. The imprint created by the eye is one acting within a system of forces that arises as we move within a whole context of forces also when we hold ourselves upright. Here lies the physical imprint of the eye. So you should not seek this imprint of the eye in anything comparable to a plaster cast. It is rather an imprint in a system of forces. And this, ultimately, is what it also is in the head, though here in a different system of forces. Yesterday, in fact, I pointed out that the eye imprints itself into the head's temperature conditions. Thus, in the way the head's various organs are permeated by different temperatures. That is the eye imprint. This eye imprint is also an imprint within a system of forces, but here a system of temperatures. Thus the eye creates imprints for itself in the most diverse ways, where it remains free of other contributory effects in the human organism, it makes a pure 
or you could say a mechanical imprint of forces. The eye creates for itself an imprint of balancing and dynamic forces in relation to our limb and metabolic system. But here we must also consider that we are actually different in nature, depending on whether we stand still, walk, or even swim. Unfortunately, people take far too little account of this. In fact, we must say of many things not sufficiently considered from a spiritual, scientific perspective that they clearly show us the self-imposed limits of modern science, the real facts researchers fail to engage with. In this regard, for instance, I was interested in something which I will only mention now in passing and will leave as a question to be answered during these lectures. I studied the customary literature and found it stated everywhere, somewhat disarmingly, that there is little difference between the volume of nitrogen in inhaled or exhaled air. This is stated more or less everywhere, but it is not true. The recorded volumes testify immediately to the untruth of the statement, showing that more nitrogen is exhaled than inhaled. But because materialism has no idea what to make of this difference, it cancels it out with a shrug of dismissal. Such things happen in modern research. As I said, I will just leave this here as a question and return to it later. Now, however, I would like to look at the human etheric body. It is self-evident that a merely physical scientific approach cannot arrive at a differentiated consideration of this etheric body. But if you can assure yourself of the existence of this etheric body, you will have to admit that it would be an odd thing to see the physical body as one blurred mass without differentiating between, say, the stomach, heart, and liver. But that is what we do in relation to the etheric body if we posit it as a general and scarcely differentiated entity, a, a sort of mist. We must study it properly, and today we will see how study of it is connected with an essential idea, which we considered from a different angle during our last medical course. This idea is one I would like to touch on today from a more spiritual scientific perspective. If we consider the ether in general, of which the human etheric body is naturally a part, a distinct configuration of it, we find, as you already know from the general literature of spiritual science, that it is not undifferentiated, but initially comes to our attention in the form of four ether types, warmth ether, light ether, chemical ether, and life ether. Light ether is a word coined, of course, from the point of view of people who can see. The primary and most striking effect of this ether is connected with light for those who have the sense of sight. In fact, it contains other effects we overlook only because most of us can see. In, if most of humanity were blind, we would have to give another name to this ether, since its other aspects would come to the fore instead, and for blind people this is actually the case. The third type of ether is the chemical ether. This acts primarily in the so-called chemical part of the spectrum. When we speak of the chemical ether, we should not think only of, say, forces active in processes of chemical synthesis, but also of forces that are polar opposite to these. Ether forces are always polar opposite to those acting in physical substances. Thus, whenever a chemical synthesis arises, the etheric forces act in an analytical way. This means that analytic forces are present everywhere in synthesizing forces. In undertaking a chemical analysis, the spiritual researcher will always find the following. We do a chemical analysis, I'll draw this schematically, and chemically isolate the constituents of a substance. See also plate 2, but there's a drawing. 
and then the ether body remains afterward. In a manner all the more compact due to synthesis of the ether forces, in exactly the same way as the soul and spirit remain after we die. Anyone who undertakes a chemical analysis with what I will call eyes of spirit sees after he has isolated the constituents of a chemical substance the remaining ghost of this substance in a proportionally more condensed and compacted form. I only say this to show you that chemical ether forces should not be regarded merely as chemical forces, as synthesizing and analyzing forces, but always as their polar opposite aspect. And then, as another distinct type of ether, we have the life ether, which is the actual animating element in all organic life. Now, this ether is an entity generally present in the universe and as such cannot, of course, be perceived by direct physical means. In this respect, scientists have grown a little more candid than they used to be, acknowledging that theories about the ether cannot be posited on merely physical modes of observation. Countless such theories were proposed in the past, but proponents of relativity now state that there is no such thing as ether. The world must be explained without it. In other words, they have become more honest, agreeing with Einstein that physical observations do not lead us to ether, but nor do they lead us to any other mode of observation. Since people have ceased to have any perception of the ether, they now simply exclude it from con- consideration. What in fact happens is this. Once a supersensible element has created an imprint in the physical and sensory realm, then this imprint becomes permeable for the corresponding supersensible activity. You see, therefore, that the general ether creates for itself an imprint in the aqueous realm of the human head. What we must regard as the brain's aqueous content should not be thought of as merely undifferentiated fluid but is just as thoroughly organized as our solid limbs. It is really a very odd way to view the human being if we see him more or less in the same terms as drawings depict him. If we map the human body with liver and stomach, such a drawing is really only a silhouette of something that is in fact intrinsically interwoven with aqueous and gaseous parts. What we draw is really only a depiction of, as it were, small grains embedded in a greater flux. It does not even compose 10% of us. In reality, of course, in physical terms, we are just as much water, air, and warmth organisms. And within us the water or fluid is just as fully organized as the solid parts. We never draw this in anatomical or physiological drawings. The substance composing our aqueous content is, of course, involved in a continual process of dissolution and renewal. The form of it is, you can say, only configured for a moment, but it is still structured. This aqueous part of the human head is indeed where we find the imprint of the etheric. To draw a diagram, I would therefore have to draw the physical activity, which is most strongly developed in the occiput, more or less like this, see figure 7 shaded. It radiates through the whole organism, of course, see also plate 2. Naturally, it penetrates the whole organism. Then, for the aqueous part, I would have to draw the rest like this, figure 7, yellow. It is organized, thoroughly permeated, so that this aqueous element is an imprint of something etheric in nature. Whatever is an imprint becomes permeable in this way. Since the intrinsic nature of the eye is created by light, as Goethe describes so clearly, it is permeable to light. This is not merely a metaphor, but profound wisdom. The I, E-Y-E, did indeed arise from light. 
We can even trace this in embryology, seeing that the eye develops and is organized from outside inward. Because it is organized and structured by light, it is permeable to light. But over and above this, the head's aqueous organization means that it is permeable to the etheric, because it is an imprint arising from the ether. And so we can say that the etheric is able to pass through the head here, see figure 7 above, red arrow, without in any way being obstructed or disturbed in its passage, and can penetrate into the rest of the human organism. This is something we can certainly observe through spiritual science. But we also need to consider how this law is modified. This part of the human head is, in fact, only permeable for the warmth ether and light ether. Only the warmth ether and light ether can work upon the human head from without. The warmth ether does not act directly via heat radiation, but affects the human head through the fact that we are embedded in a particular climatic region. In other words, instead of seeking the action of the warmth ether on the human head in relation to whether you are perspiring or not, you must ascertain whether you live in an equatorial, temperate, or cold zone of the earth. You see, the warmth ether's connection with the human head goes far deeper than merely streaming in from without. As far as physiology is concerned, psychology involves other aspects that go beyond our present scope. We must think in similar terms of the influence of the light ether on the human organism. This is far more enduring than simple external light influences. The activity of this light ether passes through the etheric imprint in the human head and exerts an organizing influence throughout the human being. So as we saw, the human head organization is permeable to warmth ether and light ether. It is not quite accurate, but nevertheless approximately correct to say that the human head is somewhat permeable to chemical ether and life ether. We can neglect this here, however, since the outcome is still as I will now describe. The chemical ether and life ether that are present are repulsed by the organization of the head, as you can see from the above. They are repulsed, but instead they pass through the, in the human organism. By virtue of the fact that we live on earth as human beings, we are inwardly filled with life ether and chemical ether. We can put it like this. The influence of the warmth and light ether streams in from all sides. See figure 8, descending arrows. The action of the chemical and life ether streams up through the system of metabolism and limbs toward the in-streaming warmth and light ether. Figure 8 and plate 2. Just as the organization of the human head is, one can say, somewhat anxiously predisposed to allow in only traces, if possible, of life ether and chemical ether, the metabolic and limb system, by contrast, really sucks up the life ether and chemical ether from the element of earth. These two types of ether meet within us, and the human organization is such that it culminates in maintaining an ordered separation of these two types of ether, life ether and chemical ether on the one hand, streaming upward from below, and warmth ether and light ether on the other, streaming downward from above. Intrinsic to the human organism is the fact that its lower system, in a sense, does not organically incorporate what streams in from above, the light ether and warmth ether, except insofar as it streams in by this path. And equally, nothing may stream in from below to influence something different in nature. Thus, light ether and warmth ether must stream in from outside. Life ether and chemical ether must stream in from below. And the organism, sustained as it must be, if we are to live within our normal organization, causes an interplay of these two streams. We can begin to understand the nature of this interplay 
if, firstly, we study people who are distinctly malnourished. Here we gain an impression that resides entirely in the realm of imaginative perception to which we can easily raise ourselves. However, if the reality of imagination has once been brought home to us in even the subtlest way. In fact, nothing so easily invokes imaginative pictures as observing pathological conditions in the human being. Now, if we see a malnourished person before us, we find that his metabolic organization, in other words, what occurs in the metabolism, binds the ether and does not let it go. If you look, say, at the stomach or liver of a malnourished person, you will find that he retains the life ether and the chemical ether. He binds these ethers to himself, does not let them go, giving rise, therefore, to a deficiency of upstreaming life ether, life ether and chemical ether. In consequence, the light ether and warmth ether press down upon such a person from above so that his whole organism assumes a condition which previously only existed in the head due to the action of light and warmth ether. These ethers reconfigure the whole organism so that in a certain sense it comes to resemble the head organization too strongly. Then a person becomes almost entirely head through malnutrition. He is, as it were, transformed into being entirely head, and this is of very great importance in the study of malnutrition. Then, by contrast, we can observe someone suffering from the opposite of malnutrition. These things become apparent in extreme states, and we have to be able to observe them properly. You will no doubt ask what the opposite of malnutrition is. One instance of a condition in which the spiritual researcher finds the opposite of malnutrition is something is commonly called quote, softening of the brain, close quote. Just as malnutrition is due to a person being permeated by what ought to remain in the head and should only make its way into the upper organism, so in softening of the brain the head is permeated by what should remain in the stomach does not belong in the brain but in the stomach and only exerts a duly organizing action in the latter. In other words, the organism is too active in working upon what it assimilates in the process of digestion. It acts on it and converts it excessively, does not sufficiently hold it back before it passes the gateway through which it enters the head. The consequence of this, of course, is that due to too much being, as it were, poured into the head, more is also eaten than is appropriate for the particular human organization. We can also clearly observe the further effects of such things. Indeed, to gain any insights in the areas we are discussing, it is of very great significance to form an idea of how these processes continue and develop. What happens when these processes, which are really quite normal at the outset, such as eating, digesting, assimilation in the abdomen, transfer toward the head, and so forth, continue and exceed the goal normally assigned them by the organism? In a malnourished person, through the irregularity that arises in the lower system, the two ether types work together abnormally and do so also in an overnourished person through irregularities in the upper system. The two types of ether do not work together as they ought to in the human organism. Due to this inappropriate interplay of the ether working in from outside and the ether rising up from within us, the following occurs. An ether that acts upon us from without but does not cease its action at the right place instead permeating us more strongly than it should, is toxic for the human organism. It has a poisoning effect on our organization due to the fact that it does not come to a halt at the right place, failing to engage in the right way with the ether rising up from within us. And likewise, if we study the inner ether, the other type of ether that works from within, This ether has a generally softening effect when it exceeds its due scope. 
whereas the toxic effect first mentioned leads to us becoming etherically rigidified, the opposite effect means that we flow out too much, dissolve. Too much life is poured out over us, along with too much of a polar chemical nature. We can no longer preserve ourselves, but soften and dissolve. So, here we have two polar effects, the toxic and the softening, dissolving effect. Studying the human being in this way and asking what he really is, we find that as far as his physical nature is concerned, he is an organic being that holds asunder the two types of ether in the right way and also in turn allows them to work together in the right way. The whole human organization is really predisposed to allow the two ether types to work together correctly. And now we are coming closer to what I meant by saying that we are entirely organized throughout. It is self-evident that we are inwardly differentiated, that is, organized, in relation to water, air, and temperature. But we are also differentiated in relation to the ether. In this case, though, the differentiation is a fluctuating one, a continual process and interplay in us of light and warmth ether on the one hand, descending from above downward as peripheral impetus, and of life and chemical ether on the other, which pushes up from below as outward-directed centrifugal dynamic. This gives rise to the etheric configuration we call the human being, really as a reconfiguration of the vortex, formed as the two types of ether encounter each other. The form you encounter here has to be understood in terms of the interplay of the two types of ether. It is of some importance to bracket form ideas about human health and sickness, close bracket, by drawing specifically on still less obvious processes such as those of malnutrition and obesity. Clinical obesity does not merely mean that we stuff ourselves. If we have acquired a better than average digestion, we are likely to be far less obese than if we have in some way impaired our digestion so that food is not properly assimilated. As our point of departure, therefore, we can try to focus on what we find by observing these initial processes, which are still very much within normal bounds. At the same time, it is also important to say that if we could not fall ill, we could not be human beings at all. Illness is simply a continuation or progression beyond due bounds of processes we need that are indispensable. Human health, we can say, is the condition in which pathological and curative processes are in appropriate equilibrium. We are not in fact only at risk when pathological processes manifest, but also when curative processes overshoot their target. Then too we are vulnerable. When introducing a healing process, therefore, it is important not to proceed too radically, which will mean we overshoot our target, suppressing the illness so that, pushed back to zero point, it rebounds instead in the other direction. In this context, it is very striking to see the kinds of instinctive therapeutic approaches people had in former times. Anyone who has studied these things will, I think, acknowledge that wonderful therapeutic approaches existed in ancient cultures, founded on human instincts. Though these were not consciously understood, they certainly existed, and even where we find them in decadent form today, as in ethnic tribes, such lore is still impressive. Not so long ago, gentlemen who were otherwise very scholarly in their own fields caused a stir through their somewhat dilettante preoccupation with such things. A dispute broke out between scholars in Jena and Berlin relating to Pithecanthropus erectus. As we know, Virchow argued with Haeckel that the Pithecanthropus discovered by Dubois 
revealed clear signs of healing, of mended bones, which a modern physician can interpret as evidence of an intentionally induced healing process. This was one of Virchow's main objections, leading him to the hypothesis that this Pithecanthropus erectus was cured by a physician, and that physicians must therefore have been around in those times, resembling Virchow himself, no doubt, who initiated the cure by externally applied means. He argued, therefore, that Pithecanthropus was not some missing link preceding the human being per se, but that this was a human being. A proper physician might just feasibly have cured an ape, but this was not accepted. The counter-argument by the other scholars stomping around in just as dilettante a way, since all they did was express general suppositions, ran as follows. Spontaneous cures also occur in animals, without human intervention, and can easily resemble the cure that occurred in the case of the Pithecanthropus. I cite this example only to show the lack of clarity prevailing today. Much was written and published about this in the early 90s of the last century, and academic disputes of this kind are indicative of the type of arguments we often meet today. In the instinctive ideas of a more primitive humanity, therefore, we do indeed find what could be called, quote, instinctive therapy, close quote. From such instinctive therapeutic approaches emerged a very important principle, that the art of healing must not be imparted to anyone unreliable, because at the same time one would have to reveal the art of making people ill. This principle was rooted in primal medical practices and was very strictly adhered to. It is also one of the reasons why ancient medical teachings were shrouded in a certain secrecy. Pathological processes, therefore, are nothing other than a further development of processes indispensable in a healthy person. If we were unable to fall sick, then we would not think or feel either. Everything that ultimately comes to expression in the psyche, as thinking and feeling, is in clinical terms a system of forces that becomes pathological when it exceeds its proper bounds. And the other thing to be aware of is that an intrinsically physical process only occurs in one part of the human head. This physical process occurring in the human head is a necessary concomitant to our human, capital I, experience. When this process is disturbed, or in other words, where a vitalizing process overwhelms this purely physical process in us, the I is in a certain sense dulled and numbed, also in our conscious mind. And all cases where a person becomes delirious, mentally incapacitated or similar, result partly and must be correspondingly diagnosed from something that has occurred as a purely physical process. Of course, other organic causes can also exist. You see, therefore, that What is initiated by the human head, and from there streams through the whole organism, is a purely physical process, which at the moment of death occurs, floods the whole organism. This moment is always present in the human head, or at least emanates from it in a centralizing fashion. But it is paralyzed by the vitalization process rising from the other part of the organism we actually continually bear in us the forces that cause death. And we could not be an I without bearing these death forces. We could only desire to be physically immortal, as humans physically existing upon the earth, if we relinquished the capacity for self-awareness. It is necessary, as I have pointed out, to develop certain intimate observational capacities so as to provide external verification of this. At the same time, however, it would be very useful for a great number of doctoral theses studied, excuse me, if a great number of doctoral theses studied how rejuvenation treatments, which counter aging, affect a person's state of mind and soul. 
I have nothing against rejuvenation cures as such, for some might well find it worth while to exchange a few more years of life at an advanced age for a little feeble-mindedness. But anyone who wishes to study the real nature of processes at work in illness and health must consider these things. They do indeed exist, but are overlooked in the same way as the fact that we exhale a greater volume of nitrogen than we inhale. The more we engage with these subtleties of the human organization, the more we begin to gain insight into processes of illness that are in fact nothing other than a coarser manifestation of these subtler processes. What I have identified here is just a transposition of these subtler processes into a more starkly apparent form. We have to see that the eye counteracts, for as long as possible, what works in us, permeates us as physical process, and that this eye is intrinsically bound up with this reactive function. It opposes this physical process as long as the latter does not become too strong. This physical process is implicit in continual dying within the human organism and in what ultimately manifests in death. In fact, if the physical process hypertrophies, as it were, so that the eye can no longer control it, the eye is compelled to leave the physical body, which can of course occur at an earlier stage of life if an excessive physical effect arises somewhere in us with further ramifications throughout the body. And so we can say that the human eye is intimately connected with death. See plate 2. You can in fact study the most the eye most precisely by studying death, though not in the general and nebulous way people imagine death, which allows you to take all sorts of liberties. The way people picture death today can be likened to how they imagine the destruction of a machine, where it seems to them that death is just cessation. They do not picture the real process involved, and so conceive of death as the destruction of a machine. But this is of no help at all. Instead, we must engage with what actually specifically occurs. Cessation of life is not death, but as far as the human being is concerned, death is, as I have described it here, while for animals it is something quite different. Those who regard death in a human being and animal as something identical are doing the same thing as someone who finds a razor and tries to carve a joint with it since a blade is a blade. They think that death is death, but in fact it is quite different in us than it is in animals, as I have tried to show. The animal, which has no eye at all, but only an astral body, has a quite different kind of death, arising from the very nature of its astral body. Illness is a condition in which death-bringing forces are diluted, checked or suppressed in a normal organism. Just as death is connected with the eye, so illness goes hand in hand with the human being's astral body. See plate 2. The astral body is the seat of all that is connected with illness. And what the astral body perpetrates is in turn impressed into the etheric body. This is why illness comes to expression as imprint in the etheric body, although the etheric body itself has no immediate connection with illness. Earlier, I described the irregular and disordered interplay and confluence of the two types of ether. But this irregularity is itself in turn merely the effect of the astral body imprinting itself in the etheric body. If we take a closer look at this, we can trace it back to the astral body. Going into this in more detail, we have a polar aspect that counters illness, and this is health. See plate 2. Etheric body is health. It will be better not to define health to begin with. But by analogy, you can see something that is increasingly clear in spiritual research. Health is assigned to the etheric body in the same way as illness to the astral body. And just as death and the eye belong together, so healing or curing 
means having the capacity to create counter actions in the etheric body to the illness inducing influences emanating from the astral body to paralyze the forces of the astral body with their illness inducing influences we have indeed to work from the etheric body then there is a fourth thing which in a certain sense is polar opposite to death. First, however, I need to point out that human death occurs quite specifically when our whole inner organization has passed over into the physical realm in a way that renders impossible the initiation of any kind of nutritional process, seen in the most radical sense. This is the death that occurs in old age. Death in old age is really the organism's loss of capacity to absorb substances. This phenomenon has not yet really been discerned and is or can be so little observed because people usually die beforehand through other causes than wasting or marasmus in its fullest flowering or more aptly unflowering. Readers aside, marasmus is spelled M-A-R-A-S-M-U-S and the readers aside. But really a failure of nutrition is at work. The body can no longer accomplish nutrition properly since it has become too physical. And thus the polar opposite of death is nutrition. And nutrition in us is assigned to the physical body. See plate 2. The different levels work back upon each other. Nutrition accomplished in the physical body works back upon the etheric body and is therefore also connected with a curative effect. This is again something that works back as reaction on what proceeds from the astral body. If we try to directly observe in daily life what I have now described, we can also verify it from the other perspective. If you take something discovered through our earlier spiritual scientific inquiries, You will need to make a clear division here. See plate 2. For during sleep, at least in relation to the head and respiratory organization, the eye and astral body sunder themselves entirely from the physical body. This is not true in relation to the metabolic and circulatory organization, where these aspects remain connected. It is not precisely true to say that the eye and astral body depart Instead, and I touched on this often in the past, many years ago already, it is true to say that in relation to the head organization, the eye and astral body emerge from the physical body and etheric body during sleep, but thereby penetrate the metabolic and circulatory organization all the more. A reconfiguration occurs as parallel phenomenon to the alternation of day and night on earth. In fact, it is true, of course, that the whole earth is not simultaneously plunged into night or day, but that the locus of day and night keeps changing. The same applies to what is really a precise imprinting of day and night upon human sleeping and waking. While we are awake, our physical and etheric bodies in the head and breathing organism are intimately connected with the eye and astral body, whereas in sleep the physical and etheric bodies of the metabolic and circulatory organism are far more intimately connected with the eye and astral body than is the case while we are awake. A rearrangement occurs, a rhythmical reconfiguration occurring between sleeping and waking. But now in sleep we can see, at least for the upper human organization, that the astral body departs with the eye. We may sometimes observe that a person's astral body and eye sees hold too strongly of his head organization, or perhaps also his respiratory organization. They take too strong a hold, grasp it too strongly, and here the astral body is acting out of its illness-inducing forces then we can find it it is necessary to take measures to drive this astral body out of the head and respiratory organizations again, to drive it out so that they separate from each other in a certain sense, 
and allow normal conditions to be re-established. As one can observe, intake of very small doses of phosphorus and also sulfur can induce this. Small doses of these substances act to drive out an astral body embedding itself too strongly in the physical and etheric body. The sulfur acts more on the astral body, the phosphorus more on the eye, which, because it permeates and organizes the astral body, really works as one with the latter. Here we can directly perceive what is happening in a person with a morbid state whose symptoms we can describe as an excessive tendency to sleep. Thus, if we find a pathology which includes symptoms of comatose conditions, then this is indicative of a need to work, as I said, with phosphorus and sulfur. If the opposite condition arises with its seat in the metabolism and circulatory organism, in which the astral body and the eye intervene too little in the physical body, so that one wishes to invite these gentlemen to get more involved, to work a little harder and more actively, then we need the action of not too highly diluted arsenic. Here we work to draw in the astral body into the physical organism. The suggestions I am making are drawn from a detailed, holistic view of the human being. If the astral body becomes too inwardly active, thus working too strongly on the physical body, This can be remedied with sulfur and phosphorus. When, in contrast, the astral body works too weakly, becoming too inwardly lazy, so that the etheric body predominates due to its insufficient power of resistance to what works from below, then one can remedy this with arsenic. Here, then, we have two polar opposites in the phosphorus and sulfur action and that of arsenic. But now we can also find that Merely regulating things from one pole or the other will not solve the problem, since an irregularity in one part of the human being immediately causes a counter-effect and is perpetuated in an opposite irregularity somewhere else. The disorder in the upper organization soon expresses itself in a disorder in the lower organization. And this interplay of two disorders is something that Well, forgive me, the expression is not appropriate for life in general, but just for a clinical view of things, is really most fascinating. This disordered interplay where the two activities are not in equilibrium, but where, instead, too weak an influence from above calls forth too strong a one below, or vice versa. These things are polar opposite not only as regards their level and direction, but also, of course, their intensity. This interplay is the most complex thing at work in us. If we understand this fully, we therefore find it necessary to re-establish balance by invoking the forces at work in us, rebalancing them again. And this is aided by the action of antimony. The actions of antimony, which today I believe are more or less overlooked in mainstream medicine, and work in a way that people no longer understand, though they were known in former times, are largely due to their capacity to bring their actions to bear within us, creating an equilibrium point of sorts. It really is extremely interesting to observe the opposite mode of action of phosphorus, arsenic, and antimony in relation to what occurs in us through them. Whatever comes to a certain state of rest, as a substance in the outer world, expresses its true nature when its action takes effect within the human being. For only then do we really see what is still alive in it, whereas an external perspective only shows us what has, as it were, coagulated as residue of its developmental process. If you look at arsenic outwardly, it really embodies, in the external world, the end of a process whose beginning can be found within us. We can never gain full insight into a substance we observe in the outer world if we do not know, at the same time, 
how it acts inside the human organism. As well as the field of chemistry, there is also one of anti-chemistry. Chemistry only means looking from one angle, from behind, at an entity that has a front and back. A being with a back also has to be observed from the front, and only then, by comparing these two aspects, can we gain an impression of its totality. Having only observed what lives in a substance by examining its rear view, we must then also go round to the front and take a look at how it acts in the human organism. Besides pursuing chemistry, we also need anti-chemistry and in the interplay of both we gain insight into the true underlying realities. We will look at this in detail, in more detail, tomorrow. The end of lecture three, excuse me, the end of lecture two.